Good afternoon. It is 3.13, Wednesday, March 4th. This is the TDN Writer's Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I am the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And it's starting to feel like spring in Red Bank, but it always feels like summer in this room. I agree with that, Joe. I'm Bill Finley, and once again, don't have a title. Jonathan Green, uh, general manager of DJ Stable. And according to the CDC, you're supposed to wash your hands for 20 seconds. So I am going to elongate this inter <laughs> this introduction by 20 seconds. So that way you can just repeat it and throw it on repeat when your kids need to wash their hands, when you need to wash their hands. Um, and three, two, one, that's 20 seconds. Public service announcement we're from we're, John we're Green. We're full service. Fresh off the win by, by proven strategies, by the way. Congratulations Thank on you. that. Thank you. Thank you. It was exciting. The CDN Writers Room is sponsored by Keeneland, the home of world-class racing and industry-leading sales. The spring race meet begins Thursday, April 2nd, and Keeneland's next auction is the April two-year-olds in training and horses of racing age sale directly after opening weekend on April 7th. There's still time to nominate your horses of racing age with entries being accepted up until the sale. Uh, over the weekend, we had Ette Indian, who was a Keeneland grad. Tonal is shape. Also, Keeneland grad won the Devona Dale turn back. Spice is nice. Sombaye won the Canadian turf. Uh, the, the horse that I wanted to mention, especially with the horses of racing age portion of the sale coming up, was New York Central, who was bought for $240,000 last November at Keeneland during the racehorse section. He won the Saudi Sprint, and Keeneland grads finished 1-2-3 in there. He was a TDN rising star who uh, I, I th thought was a little bit of an underachiever for a while, but now... Now that he's won this big race, he has a. I, I think he has a chance to really contend in the sprint division this year. And, you know, it, it shows that buying horses of racing age can be pretty lucrative because they've already made a nice profit on him. Uh, any, any thoughts on him, John? Well, just the idea of being able to buy ready-made horses at the at the horses of racing age sale. It's something that um, that we've done over the years, uh, you know, with with uh, with some good success. And um, you know, we're actually putting a couple of horses in the sale. I think I mentioned it last time, and that list has actually uh, grown to almost five or six now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that that Taylor Made is selling them because last time I said that we had three or four, and we got like ten calls from consignors <laughs> saying who who's going to represent you, which is always a very very nice thing, and yeah. and, and is quite an honor. Um, but we we found that just the opportunity to maximize and be able to you know sell horses and then if they go on to do bigger and better things you know God bless you know for the people that that, that bought them I think Mark Cassie said something similar if somebody claims a horse off him and they and they do you know do well with the horse that's great it's good for the industry um, but at the end of the day you know you want to go to a sale with open eyes not only you know for selling but also for buying opportunities and it's great too for the fans as well because sometimes when you have the breeding stock sales and these mares go to sell you know you're probably not going to see them again with the horses of racing age sale you know people are buying with the intent of racing them so you know that they're going to show up somewhere else and you get to see them run again um so this week we have a pack show this week um in a little bit we'll be talking to mark cassie about his kind of seismic op-ed about Ben and Clem Buterol. Uh, we'll get to the Saudi Cup and the Fountain of Youth and all the big racing over the week weekend. But we had some breaking news this morning. Bill Finley reported in the TDN that Kieran McLaughlin is leaving training and is going to become the new agent for Luis Saez. Saez's previous agent, Richard DePass, is going to retire. Obviously, huge news for a guy who's been at or near the top of the game for a while now and trains for some really big name guys and trained, has trained some big horses. Uh, I guess I'll just open it up to you guys. Bill, you spoke to him. How do you think that he is entering this new phase of his life? Well, he has a very good uh, outlook on this. He seems very excited about it. And uh, obviously, he's got a very good young rider, a young guy who's 27 years old, who's right on the top in the, the jockey standings in Gulfstream. He's second. He's going to be a guy who's going to win a lot of races. But, uh, Joe, what you said earlier is is what is most pertinent. We've seen plenty of trainers go to be jockey agents, but they're usually guys that win seven, eight races a year type of people. Kieran McLaughlin is one of the top 20 or so trainers in the country easily. So what does this say about the training profession when a guy who's doing as well as Karen McLaughlin is, has trained a horse of the year in Invasor, has great clients in the Maktoum family, et cetera, for obvious reasons, most of which are financial, says, I'm getting out of this. I'm going to become a jockey agent. No question about it. And, and I think it, it comes down to two things for Kieran. Um, one is the all the issues he's had to deal with in the past 12 months um, with the Department of Labor, with, um, you know, with, with 
constantly um, having to regulate medications and the new whipping rules and all kinds of new safety rules, which I'm sure he's, he's all for, um, but they just add on to the burden of being a trainer on top of the fact that you're dealing with all these fragile animals all the time um, and, they're, and, and the owners um, that are constantly putting pressure on you to, to win races. Um, you know, not that I'm a doctor, um, although I can play one on this podcast, um, yes. certainly... You just uh, told me to watch, watch their hands. <laughs> watch their hands so 20, so I'll, now. I'll just stick with that, okay, yeah. good, with, with being a pre- pretend medical uh, professional. Um, but Kieran does suffer from MS, and one of the pressures of uh, triggers for MS is also stress. Um, so I'm sure being able to eradicate and eliminate um, Department of Labor and visa chasing, um, you know, for his employees um, and, and all the other, you know, factors that, that are involved with racing, to be able to eliminate that and take on a phenomenal jockey like Luis Saez um, that he has a relationship with that's won a bunch of races for him and really is the top of the game. Um, it, it seems like it's a no-brainer on multiple levels for somebody like uh, like Kieran, who's going back to um, a position that he had before when he was Chris Antley's agent. Yeah, and you know we wish we wish him all the best. I didn't know him that well. I've spoken to him a couple of times, and and he was he was always pleasant with me. But I think one of the things I'll remember about Kieran McLaughlin as a trainer is that he's one of the guys in the business that really nobody had a bad word to say about him. Everybody I've ever spoken to about him loves him, and and supports him. I think, and I, I think we should mention that. One of the things that that has precipitated this is the issues he's had with the New York Department of Labor. He's not the only trainer that's had those issues, and but that was pretty much at the forefront of why he decided to make this move in his career that it's becoming too onerous to become a to be a trainer especially in New York previously he had announced that he was going to move his string out of New York and go to Kentucky and New Jersey and now he's going to get it out of the training business altogether um, do you guys think that'll lead to more trainers maybe stepping out it obviously wouldn't happen to the guys like Chad Brown because they're too young and too big right now but do you think that this will become more of a trend in racing I I think it could be. And, you know, what we don't really know is the finances of being a trainer. And Karen said to me, one of the quote was, he goes, you know, all these guys out here are just hoping to break even. And, you know, that's whether you're working, um, you know, in a widget factory, whether you're uh, a horse trainer, whether you're a school crossing guard, whether, you know, you're John Green running the Green Group Corporation. Nobody wants to have a job where they're, quote unquote, just lucky to break even. So, You know, when you take that into account, are we talking about that, well, Bob Baffert, Chad Brown, Todd Pletcher, they're probably all doing great, but is then there a case of, and everybody else? Maybe. Because, you know, going back to what I said earlier, you know, you've seen the guys that are not successful trainers make the transition, but you don't normally see a guy like this. I mean, he was 22nd in the country in earnings last year, and I bet you that was for him was kind of a down year as well. So um, it, it could be, you know, Jockey H is making an awful lot of money. You know, purses are up. I mean, one thing I didn't write this in my story, one thing Karen said kind of tongue in cheek is, geez, I wish I got this done a week earlier. Luis Saez just walked away with a million dollars for winning the Saudi Cup. And then the agent's cut would be roughly uh, 25% would be $250,000. That's some serious coin. Yeah, and, and there, there are a few guys in this business, I think, right now, who are be- whose book is better to take on right now. I mean, maybe a Rat Ortiz Jr. or like maybe one or two other guys, but I've always been a big Luis Saez fan, another great guy, great kid, and he, I've always thought that he was a little bit underrated, and now I think that he's winning these big-time races. This is He had $2 million wins last year, one of them for John Green Corporation, and this year now with the Saudi Cup, I think he's finally being recognized with, with about for what he was all this time, which is a top jockey day in, day out. And one of the things I love about Luis Saez, he's one of those guys that rides the same way no matter what the race is. Whether it's a 12-5 maiden claimer or whether it's a grade one, he always tries his absolute best. And I think that was that was shown in the Saudi Cup because he really had to get after. We'll talk more about it later, but he really had to get after maximum security early on in that race and on the turn. He really rode the hair off him, and he he earned it all the way. And so I'm I'm, I'm happy for Luis Saez. I'm happy for Kieran McLaughlin. You brought up the the other big trainers and the, the few guys that are making money. That's I wanted to segue from that into where we think that these Kieran McLaughlin horses are going to go because he does train for a select number of clients, and the major ones obviously are Godolphin and Shadwell. And we've seen Chad Brown get more Shadwell horses in recent years. We actually have seen, I saw last year, a couple of Godolphin horses go to Bill Mott. For the, that's the first time that I've seen that. And I would just like to say personally, 
I w- I hope that they spread these horses out a little bit and not just give them all to Chad Brown and Bob Baffert. And that's not anything that's not anything that I have negatively any feelings I have negatively towards those guys. They do a great job. They're great trainers. Bob Baffert's in the Hall of Fame for a reason. Chad Brown is obviously well on his way to the Hall of Fame. I just think in general, with these massive operations giving all their horses to one or two trainers who already win everything, I think it's bad for the game and I think it exacerbates that problem that you're talking about, Bill where the vast majority of your trainers can't get by. No question about it. And and we had a horse, obviously, a thread of blue with, with Kieran. And uh, when he told us the other day that he was going to make this career move, um, you know, he didn't even ask, you know, to whom do we want to send the horse? He he knew that we work with a number of trainers and, and that we would make a decision. I would assume that if the horses aren't going to go to either of the two guys you mentioned, that um, his brother is still very involved. Uh, Kieran's brother is very involved in, in the day-to-day operations of his barn and and uh, implementing a lot of this training strategies that, that Kieran, um, you know, implements. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, if, you know, he ends up picking up a couple of horses uh, out of this group as well. You would like to think that with these super trainers, that eventually, um, you know, because of stall space or because there just aren't that many tracks that they can bring these top horses to, that there'll be some kind of, you know, trickle down effect um, involved in it. Um, And, you know, and and therefore maybe one of the assistants or somebody else is going to break off and have a few horses with, um, you know, with with another trainer. Um, But for right now, there's no law against, uh, there's no rule against, you know, these guys just taking as many trainers, uh, many horses as they can. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no antitrust in racing in that way. Um, and like I said, it's, not, it's nothing against those guys. They obviously do a great job, but uh, it, it makes it harder, I think, for this game to have a wider reach in terms of the people it impacts and the people that can make money in it when two or three trainers have all the great horses. And who knows? We'll see. Like Godolphin, I was happy to see Brennan Walsh Actually, finally, he got his grade one win with Maxfield, and unfortunately, he had to go off the derby trail. Looks like he's coming back. Had a bullet work the other day, but it's nice. Like that's that's a good story. That's a, as writers and as reporters and as talking heads and gas bags, we like those stories where guys who maybe not you haven't you didn't hear about five or six years ago now have their big horse and have their big moment and have their chance to get on the big stage. So, you know, I, I, it's going to be interesting to see where those horses go because there there was a lot of barn of owner power behind Kieran McLaughlin. And I think that's an interesting next turn to see where this goes. And and just for the record, um, because I have been getting inquiries on a thread of blue, we did give the horse to John service. Okay. Um, so he, he made the, the long trek um, of all of 30 feet from Kieran's barn to John's barn at, at Palmetto's. And Louis Saez is still going to be riding him, right? And we would like to think that Louis Saez would still be riding. Uh, we'd be riding him, especially if we can keep Kieran in, in the fold. Um, and, and that was one more thing I just want to mention is that you know we're fortunate enough where we get to work with a lot of top trainers. And I have to say that every communication I had with Kieran, every involvement that I had with him was always top class, always um, you know top shelf. From him to Jackie, his assistant, who helped us you know with with all the the credentials all the way through. Um, we, I have nothing but good things to say about Kieran and the way that he ran his operation and we, we we do appreciate kieran likes the show and he listens to the show that's not the only reason we're being nice to him but it's one of the reasons so we wish we wish kieran all the best and it's gonna be interesting to see the fallout from this because he was such a successful trainer with such high powered owners to see where this goes next The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With more than 500 clients in the horse business, they were bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is someone who is all over the news. Mark Cassie, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Of course. And so we, the main reason we have you on this week is you penned an op-ed in the TDN uh, earlier this week about banning the use of clenbuterol. And it's gotten huge, huge reaction from all across the globe. I'll start it with this. I come at it as a relative layman from a horse anatomy and drug standpoint. But I do know that it drives me crazy as a fan and a better to see horses get claimed by certain trainers and turn into completely new animals seemingly overnight. And to also watch the reverse happen when they leave those barns. How much of these big form reversals do you think can be attributed to clenbuterol? 95%. 95%. And, and do you think it's gotten worse over the years? Oh, yeah, it's gotten worse. And I'll tell you when it got worse. It got yeah. worse. And I don't know exactly when it was banned, but uh, some time ago they banned, uh, you know, uh, equipoise and winstrel, you know, the anabolic steroids. 
so when that happened, those were all, you know, we all, I would say we, I would say most of the trainers uh, would use it. And whenever we thought our horse, you know, needed a little pick me up or wanting, you know, needing, maybe wasn't eating, doing things. And, and when they took that away, um, then we have nothing. And now here, the, the computer all trainers, uh, the Lance Armstrongs of, of our game became more powerful and stronger because it, it, it the playing field be even became uh, farther and farther apart. I feel, you know, you feel like a lot of times you're going to, uh, you're going to a, a fight, a, a gunfight with a knife, you know, it, and um, look, I'll be the first to tell you, you, you know, training horses, is not rocket science. Uh, the guy that normally in the way it's supposed to work is the guy that has the best horse has brings his horse into, uh, you know, to the race, the best he can. And he's supposed to be the one that wins. Um, but that's not what's happening a lot of times. And we have so many, uh, ways to judge, you know, we have the buyers, we have thorough graph numbers, we have Ragus numbers, we have thorough manager numbers. We have a pretty good idea what our, the horses are supposed to do and how they're supposed to perform. And when you see somebody get a new horse and then a month or two later, you see this drastic change. Well, that's fine if it happens once and maybe if it happens twice, but when it happens time after time after time, there's a problem. Yeah. The other thing that, uh, you know, from a standpoint, a lot of people now this is a personal deal. I, you know, I, when I'm at the races, I look at all the horses. I look at, um, especially like looking at the stakes horses, because I like to see what a good looking tap it is supposed to be look like. I, I want to know what a good looking empire maker is supposed to, because when I'm out trying to buy them, I'm, I'm trying, you know, so I, I have a pretty good idea and I look at horses and, and this is all I've done my entire life. We, uh, I, I've been lucky too. I want to knock on wood. Um, I've had a few horses that have went on and done well after I lost them, but that's not the sour. I'm not, I'm not crying sour grapes. I've had very few that have done it. None of recent time, but, um, I had a horse claimed, uh, I want to say four or five years ago, uh, maybe you know, three years ago, um, when we lost him, he, uh, looked like, you know, he was like a board just had no width to him. Three months go by and, um, and trainer, uh, my assistant, Jamie Begg and I in New York, we both looked at each other. He looked like Ben Johnson. What, what was the, That's the, it, uh, ben Johnson, yeah. The, yeah, the, uh, the Olympic runner that won the, you know, was disqualified. Yep. He, he looked like a different horse. So that's, that, that's what's so crazy about it. And, and, and I explained how it works and, um, we're not allowing anabolic steroids. Why are we allowing it? Why are we allowing this? This has, I mean, you know, similar, uh, similar deals. I honestly, I have to tell you what, I didn't realize about the bone loss until I, I did a lot more studies and I'm like, huh, well, this can explain a lot. And, and I explained in my, uh, I explained in my letter how, how, uh, intact horse, has, you know, a much greater chance of, of a fatal, you know, injury. And, and, um, so it all makes sense. The other thing, it's not just about bone loss, a lot of problems that go with the heart. Um, interesting enough, I was running through most of the places don't, uh, most of the horses is at when they have the necropsies on them. Um, I don't know what they test for they don't always test for everything but i was reading a few uh, necropsies at uh in the in kentucky a, a really good horse i read where a really good horse had had dropped dead after a race and of course in his record showed he'd been on computerol so it's not just the ma the you know there's just so many factors why why do we have it when 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 the assets are the start uh, when the liabilities start outweighing the assets, then it should be gone. I, I'm, I'm actually very surprised. 
how much it's used, not just in uh, the United States and Canada, but now I'm seeing how it's being used in Europe and other countries as well. There's, it's not a, a very long withdrawal on it, and I, I just don't understand it. Hey, Mark, let me jump in with a question for you. Reading that um, op-ed, you know, anybody who read that would have a hard time disagreeing with you. Uh, you made some very mm -hmm. salient points and uh, some very powerful points. But one question about this is that now clumbuterol is banned on top of the race, whatever the threshold period is. Right, before depending it, where you're at. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So now if you're going to say that you can't use clumbuterol at all, how do you catch mm -hmm. somebody? I mean, that would open up a whole can of worms unless you have massive amounts of uh, out-of-competition testing. How do you propose that the racing would enforce that? Well, if you put zero tolerance, that's one thing. The other thing, um, Bill, is I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but through a hair sample, you can go back six months. Right. And Mark, you know, again, the – the, the op-ed piece has makes a lot of sense, and we've seen um, responses, you know, not only from trainers and, and horse lovers in the United States, but but worldwide. And one of the questions that was coming up is, who ultimately has the authority to make the change to eliminate clenbuterol from uh, from racing altogether? Well, you know, the way it is now, and it's one of the reasons why I said I I, I signed to join, you know, to look for to to try to get this legislation d done through the government. Um, right now it's each state. Um, it's each state that has, is the one, you know? Um, yeah, right now it's up to each state okay. and in Canada, obviously it's, um, it's up to that Providence, I guess, Ontario. They're already, uh, I know they're working on changing that. We've had anybody that watches horse racing in Canada, especially over the last four or five years have, have seen some serious form reversals, you know, I, and I, I, I've hesitated to be honest with you to say anything because I, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want people. Oh, Mark Cassie's just crying sour grapes. But finally I just said, you know, what, enough of it. Enough. Well, one of the reasons why we're seeing such a response, Mark, is because it's actually your name and and your reputation and and you know really stellar credentials um, that that uh, you know that pen the the op ed, um, and I think that's part of the reason. Just as a, as a layperson, I think that's part of the reason why it's it it's got such a critical mass right now because if somebody at your level um, who arguably can be considered one of the top twenty you know trainers in the country is willing to go out on a limb and say, I think we should get rid of this drug rug altogether, um, that has to make people kind of sit up and take notice. Well, and, and, and I, I would say this, it happened to come out on the same day that I was, you know, nominated for the hall of fame. Um, but, but I, this had been in the root works for a long time. It just happened to work out that way. I wasn't trying to put it on top of the same day, you know, but, um, I, I John, I, I tell you what, I've been doing this for 40 years and, um, as you know, you you've been to uh, you've been to my place in Florida. I'm very fortunate. This this game has been extremely extremely good to me. It was extremely good to my father, and I'm hoping that it's going to be extremely good to Norman. And I have another son, Colby. That there's a possibility, and another son, Kyle. And I'm in the point of my in the point of my life where um, there's not a lot more out there that I need or want to accomplish. Obviously I'd like to win the Kentucky Derby and, and I like winning. I, I mean, it doesn't matter whether it's a $5,000 claimer or a $500,000 race. I like winning, but I, I feel like I'm in the point of my life where I have to give back. I have to give back for all the things that horse racing's giving to me. And I'm trying to help save it and help it. We see all these breakdowns, and how can you not, when you read any studies, when you, when, when you are increasing muscle mass and decreasing bone density, how is that not a formula for disaster? You know, I've tried very, very hard not to point out anything. You know, I did come out and, and talk about Toronto and Woodbine because I was, I've been so disappointed in in them and and so I did but you know there's things happening all over North America and I, I just don't think we're looking at uh, 
at some of the real issues. And um, and I'll, I will say this, it's not just, this is just not occurring at the racetrack. I want you to know that this is occurring. This is occurring early on. Uh, there's too many weanlings and yearlings that are getting this drug. Um, in, in the study, if you look, uh, it, uh, it shows where it, it has some, it changes the, the, uh, I don't the the structure of the bone, and I felt especially in the last few years, you know, we're getting horses um, home from the yearling sales, and I can't even break them. They'll we'll ride them around in the um, in a paddock for two weeks, and they'll be sore. And I I mean it's ridiculous. Hey Mark, it's Joe again. Uh, I had a question yes, about why you think the racetracks haven't done more to ban this and, and some other drugs, because it seems to me looking from the outside, these trainers are allowed to get so big and have so many horses that maybe there are some racetracks who are worried about making them mad and them taking their horses somewhere else. And these tracks that already have problems filling fields will be even more up a creek. Why do you think the tracks haven't done more? I think they're all I think they're worried you know, sometimes that it's going to hurt their business, but, and so that's part of it. Um, but I, I can tell you one of the, one of my reasons too, why I came out the way I did is I have some serious owners. Oh, I have owners that are questioning whether they want to stay in the game. Look, if, if this is the way I look at it. If, if, if cycling could come out and, and put uh, Lance Armstrong away, if the national, uh, or the major leagues could come out and say the Astros were cheating. Okay. Yeah. It would hurt a little bit, but in the end we have to clean up our game and and we're, you know, when we have these horses breaking down and I, I truly believe that this is a big factor in it. And, you know, we, I, uh, uh, I can remember seven or eight, maybe 10 years ago, I got in a debate with Nick Zito. And when we were talking about the synthetic track and he said, well, I, I, I worry about history. I said, you're going to be history. <laughs> yeah, for right? sure. For sure. And, yeah. and that's, you know, that's, that's what's going on. And, and so let's look at it. This is this one. This is such, this is a no brainer. Yeah. This isn't, this one isn't even close. You know, I mean, we, it's just not even close. Again, we, you know, we appreciate the fact that, that you're coming on and, and having such a strong message for, for racing, um, because it, it, you know, part of the importance is the, the strength of the message, which, which, you know, you, you actually put it together very nicely, but also the author behind it. And the fact that you can come in, um, you know, hopefully on the verge of being in the hall of fame and winning basically every, you know, important race, uh, you know, that, that, that we have in the industry, um, and to come on and say, this is an abomination. We need to fix this and we need to fix this not only in racing, but pre-racing yearling sales, weanlings, uh, two-year-old sales, certainly, um, you know, across, across the board, it's something that needs to be recognized. And, uh, it's something that we here at the podcast have been talking about and, and pounding the tables. Obviously you have a much bigger and broader audience than we do. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I appreciate you having me. And, and you know what, as you, I think you can tell just talking to me, I, I'm very passionate about this. And um, the response has been unbelievable. I've gotten calls from the biggest in the game. I've gotten calls from Japan, from Dubai, from England, from Ireland, you know. So uh, this is this is an easy fix, and yeah. we need to fix it. ASAP. Right. All right. Thanks for coming on with us, Mark. And thank you for speaking out. Appreciate it. Okay. Very right. good. Bye. Thanks. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As The Green Group Guest of the Week, Mark Cassie will receive yet another free one-hour tax consultation. The Green Group, bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. We're going to run down what happened last weekend. Obviously, there was the huge race in Saudi Arabia. There was the Fountain of Youth. Uh, I'll start with the Saudi Cup. I mentioned this before, but I, I thought it was a, it was a really great ride by Luis Saez on maximum security because 
he really had to be asked along early to be up close to the pace. And also on the turn, he was really getting scrubbed on a lot. And I think there really wasn't – watching that race, I thought until the eighth pole that Mucho Gusto was going to be an easy winner of the Saudi Cup. And I thought maximum security was really screwed on the turn with the way he was he was pumping him along. And I, I think if you asked Jason Service, too, he probably would, would have said the same thing. He thought he was screwed three furlongs from home. But, you know, great perseverance by maximum security, great perseverance from uh, Luis Saez. And it's – you know, I've – I, I've had my issues, obviously, with the ownership behind maximum security, but I mean, the horse's talent is undeniable, and it is good for him, I think, and his legacy to have that kind of win on his resume. Because up until then, most people knew him as forgetting DQ in the Derby, even though he was champion three year old, and even though he did win the Cigar Mile and the Haskell, he did have a good year all in all. It, it's good that he he got that kind of recognition. Couldn't agree more, but I think it comes to you. You um, gave credit to Luis Saez. He definitely deserves it, but let's give credit to the horse. I, you know, this is a very, very good racehorse, and I've been talking about that for months on the podcast here, and I, I think people have been a little late to give him the kind of acclaim that he deserves. Now everybody's going to have to. He wins this $20 million race against an all-star field of horses, but, you know, I, I don't know why he started off as 16000 main claiming. You know, we'll ne- never forget the Derby debacle and all that, but, you know, those things don't matter anymore. They really have been put uh, into the background as this horse just goes out time and time again and just runs his eyeballs out. And it'll be interesting to see what he does the rest of the year. I hope he has a, a significant campaign. I bet you he won't. I bet yeah. you only see him like That's two what more I times to say or something before. like that. But, you know, he's really knocking on the door of quote-unquote greatness. I, I, I'm not afraid to say that. Yeah, and I just before we get to you, John, I just wanted to mention that too. That that's that's the, that's the subplot. And I think the elephant in the room here is he's already talking about skipping the Dubai World Cup, which I don't care about the Dubai World Cup. But I think that 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 lends it to him having maybe one or two races the rest of the year, if that. So we talked, we touched on this last week. But what is this? What does this new series in the Middle East mean for American dirt racing? It can't be good. Well, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I mean this is getting insane now with these horses. You know, everybody. It used to be they wanted a month off between races then five weeks now six now everybody wants to run a horse you know th- uh, three four months in between races something like that uh, i'm sure gary west doesn't need the money but he's just got to get on a you know a, a little puddle jumper or a boat or something go a couple hundred miles and he would be you know, three to five for 12 million dollars in the dubai world cup and he's saying thanks but no thanks to that i mean i, I mean, think it's wow. service more than anything i jason service it could I be, think. but look at uh, midnight beast do the same thing okay so if, if uh maximum security didn't run she'd be the big favorite and you know it's just like uh, i mean this is mind-boggling when you hear about this stuff but yeah. you know now all of a sudden 12 million dollars isn't enough to get the best horses into a race um you know we're talking about that with the pegasus at three million but you know this is four times the purse and you know again you know who's gonna run in there um, Sir Winston from Mark Cassie, uh, you know, Tacitus, uh, Mucho Gusto. That's an okay race, but that's not, you know, what you expect from the Dubai World Cup. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when do you bring them back? I mean, you know, historically you've seen that when you run horses overseas, especially in different climates, um, that there's a bounce factor. And is it four months? Is it five months? Is it six months? Um, I don't know. And, and at this point in time, really, what does the horse need to do in 2020 in order to be older horse of the year? Yeah. Um, I guess he has to show up in the Breeders' Cup, but really it isn't. It almost doesn't matter what other you know races uh, come up uh, prior to that. And I think, if I remember correctly, on the on the on the calendar, the Breeders' Cup Championship um, at Keeneland is like a month before the Claiming Crown in in December at, at Gulfstream. Um, so he would have to go through the Breeders' Cup Championship the to double. get to get to the yeah, exactly. Then does he become horse of the year at that point because he wins the Claiming Crown also? Yeah, I mean, this, we talked about this when Jim Rome was on the show when we asked him why why racing wasn't doing better amongst amongst the regular sports fans, and he mentioned that these horses don't stick around and they don't don't have enough chance to build up a following. And I think that was definitely the case with Justify. American Pharaoh, you at least got to see a couple more times, but Justify disappears after the Triple Crown. I remember back in the day when I was first following racing, Smarty Jones, I was so excited to see him run after the Belmont. Never ran again. And I think this is another one that people know who Maximum Security is. I'm not saying it's going to make a huge difference in the grand scheme of things in terms of racing's popularity, but it can't hurt to have horses that people know and people can recognize and they know the name and have them have have full campaigns and I just don't think that's ever going to be the case for racing anymore and I think it's only going to get worse if the Saudi Cup sticks around. And, and the flip side of that, Joe, is, you know, I, I do want to have kudos for, for Jason Service um, for bringing the horse over there and having him ready to run and, and winning on 
an obviously tiring racetrack. I mean, every single horse down the, down the lane was staggering, um, you know, from the horse that was in front that almost ended up in the middle of the racetrack to, uh, you know, to the, to, uh, the Philly, uh, Midnight Bisou and, and of course the winner, um, who were, you know, really just giving it their all in order to, to make it down to the racetrack. My, my lasting memory of the race isn't going to be necessarily those two horses hitting the wire, um, together. It's actually going to be when they had the video camera, um, on the service family and, and they were watching the race, and the horse was, you know, last or next to last at the top of the stretch. Um, and you can just see Jason's face, you know, as stoic as he is, he was a little concerned. And his son was standing next to him, and he was very concerned. And, you know, his son and his and uh, Jason's wife kept looking over at Jason as they're going in the stretch, like, what's going on? How come he's not making his move? How come he's not? Oh, wait, now he's making his move, making his move. And then it wasn't until, like, the last 30 yards where Jason actually started to smile. Uh, because, you know, and I don't know if it was a smile because the horse won and or because he was so relieved that the horse actually kicked in the gear and, and, and hit the wire first. He definitely wasn't last or second to last. He was, yeah. he was like, third or fourth. But he was. It did he, look like he was, he was, he was struggling. Out. Yeah, he was struggling. It did look like he was struggling, yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, the other thing. Do you have something to say? The other thing I, that we should mention about the Saudi Cup, and, and there was a fallout from this this week, uh, Mike Smith, who apparently whipped Midnight Bizu 14 times instead of the 10 times w- which you're allowed to, uh, was hit with a $210,000 fine, uh, which was 60% of his earnings for for finishing second aboard Midnight Bizu. He was also given a nine-day suspension by the Jockey Club of Saudi Arabia. It's unclear at this point, I believe, whether or not that's going to affect him running and riding in the Santa Anita handicap cap or the San Felipe this weekend, but I, that blew me away. And I think Bill talked to him and, and I assume Mike was blown away too. There's just, what a weird thing. What a weird thing to have such a harsh penalty for. Do you think that the average person watching that race could tell between 10 whips and 14 whips? Like it's just one of these things where I understand the spirit of the rule and the, the penalties, but I mean, come on, of all people, like Mike Smith is not a guy who wails away on horses with the whip unnecessarily. It's just, I, it's, you know, in general, in general, I'm in favor of harsher penalty penalties in racing, but this is one that I seems way overboard. It, it does seem way overboard, but the rules were the rules. He knew the rules. Um, he's not saying that he didn't, uh, didn't go over the limit of 10. He's admitting that he did. He's just saying, hey, this is crazy. But yeah, you knew that beforehand. But, I, you know, first of all, I would, I'm a non-whip guy. I, I I still think racing would be better off with just no whips, period. But if you're Mike Smith and you're put in this situation, he, I think if he had to do it all over again, he probably would do the same thing. You know, what is he supposed to tell Steve Asmussen after the race when the horse is driving to the finish? Oh, I got to 10. I couldn't hit the horse anymore. You know, you put up that kind of money and that kind of pressure and the uh, his job is to get to the horse, the, the finish line first. I, he's, I'm sure he's, he think he's actually out there counting one, two, three, et cetera. You know, all he's thinking about is trying to win this race. And, you know, it, it, he did whip her quite a bit, no doubt about that but you know otherwise (laughs) what's he supposed to say to to anybody bet on the horse the owners with all this money involved you know maybe it'd be different if this was a you know a a $2,500 or $25,000 you know cowbred race on a Thursday at Santa Anita or something like that but for that kind of money the pressure to perform is huge and you know I'm sure he just did this by instinct and then we should mention that uh, the explanation that he gave Bill for why he used the stick so much uh, was that there was there was the SUV that had the tracking camera of the horses along the rail, and he said that Midnight Bizu was distracted by that and was fixated on that, so he was trying to get her attention. Yeah, and, and Bill, just to, to dovetail on, on your conversation, um, it, it, it seemed like it wasn't that long ago, but back in 1991, um, we won the Grade 1 Ashland, and we had a filly in there named Do It With Style, and Do It With Style, early on her career, um, actually bucked shins in a race the same time that um, a, a, a rider at, at Parks um, was hitting her with the stick, and she always, um, you know, felt like there was a coupling of being hit by the whip and her leg bothering her, so we get through some of these major preps, we get to the Ashland and the night before the Ashland, Gary Contessa, who was training the horse for us, actually sat us down at dinner and said, I think this filly's so fixated on looking for the whip and when she's going to get hit that I'm going to tell Shane Sellers, the rider, that we're not going to give him the whip. And we were floored. You can't do that. That's always a part of racing. And we went to the to the stewards the, um, the day of the race and explained to him that we were changing equipment. And the decision was made the decision was either we can give Shane Sellers the whip and tell him not to hit the horse 
or just just take the whip out of the equation altogether. Yeah. We took the whip out of the equation altogether, and she won by a neck. Mm -hmm. And Shane got off the horse and was standing in the winner's circle and said, if I had the whip just out of 20-plus years of, of, of doing it over and over again and, and instinct and and, um, and that's the way we're taught to, to, to encourage horses to run, I would have hit the horse with the whip. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. So it may not even be let's count the number of times that we're, that we're whipping the horse with the crop. It may just be let's just take the damn things away from the riders because in, in reality I know they're going to say, well, it helps me control the horse and stuff like that. But I don't think you can control an 1,100-pound horse with, with, a, with a handy whip anyway. I'm going to disagree with you on that one, and I think it would be a disaster from the betters' standpoint. I think you have, to, I mean, you have to assure the betters of this game that the jockey is doing everything possible to get the, to the horse maxim, to give its maximum effort. And if you talk to riders overall across the game, they think that horses do not try harder without the stick. Now, if you think that that can be trained out of them over time, that's one thing. But to just get rid of it entirely at one time, I think it's it's not good for the betters who have to be assured that every measure is being taken to get this horse to give maximum effort. And I just think I think the right rule that the rule that they have in America and a lot of places that I think is good is you're not allowed to hit them consecutively more than three times, which gives them a chance to respond. So you're not just sitting there wailing away at a horse. And I think all other rules that, that should be in effect too is when a horse is either hopelessly beaten or a horse is way, way, way in front, you put the stupid whip away. Because that drives me crazy sometimes when I see a horse ahead by eight lengths. One of the, the, the example I always think of was Chancelot in the Amsterdam. Chancelot won that race by what, 17 lengths? And Amiciel Jaramillo at the 16th pole was still hitting him with the stick. That's the stuff that looks terrible to me is that the outcome is no longer in doubt and you're still wailing away at this horse. That's the, that's the stuff I have problem, have a problem with. Overall, I'm okay with the whip, and I think betters will, will revolt if you take it away and a horse drifts at the last second and where it could have been corrected and could have gotten up and, and didn't get up. I think that's going to be a major, major problem for, for betters. Uh, Joe, a couple points to disagree with you on that. First of all, we've pretty much seen this happen already with Woodbine last year, and they took the whip, essentially took the whip away from the riders. At least they didn't let them reach back and, and you know, beat the, the crap out of the horse with, you know, overhand stick like that. And the handle didn't, wasn't affected one bit. Uh, I think betters want a level playing field. And if you take the whip away from everybody, I think betters will be happy. And, and I want you to get a chance, when you listen to this tonight, rewind to what we started out this conversation about this. And we're talking about, like, it's totally normal to whip an animal. How is that okay in, in this day and age? It's just not, you know, and I understand what you say about the betters. I mean, the betters never want to get the short end of the quote unquote stick, but <laughs> oh, um, that was a bad. Yeah, belt. right. <laughs> but if you make it a level playing field, I really don't think people will care. I mean, we're just, we're just going to disagree on that. And I, I think, you know, the, the whips that they use nowadays are they're basically nothing like compared to the stuff they used to use back in the day that would really leave welts and marks on horses and really hurt them. I think now it's more the sound than anything that scares them into running faster. And, yeah, I understand the animal rights argument of it, and I get why Peter would hate it. But I think if you know, if you know racing and you know jockeys and you know betters, you understand that this is not something that can just be taken away overnight. It has to be regulated. And if you want to regulate it out of existence eventually, that's fine. But I, I don't the woodbine thing. It's, that's, I mean, that's a small sample size. Like, who knows? And they didn't take away the whips entirely. So that's, I don't think that's like a good good comparison. But yeah, I'm just going to disagree with you guys on this. No, that's fine. And, and just the, the last comment on it. What we'll do is next week when we do the podcast, we'll each give we'll each have a whip. <laughs> and when you're trying to scramble for topsy turvy, we're going to beat the crap out of you with it until you know. Bill will do it ten times. I'll do it fourteen times. I'll take the fine. But just to see if you if come I up get with the word. If I get ten grand out of you for hitting me too many times, <laughs> yeah. I'll take it. Okay, but the horse isn't getting the two hundred ten grand. <laughs> It's, 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 you know, the, the powers that be. Whatever. 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 Okay. I'll, I'll take the Rolls Royce instead. Okay, good. All um, right. But I knew we were going to have this out eventually. It was like, I knew we were going to have the whip discussion eventually because I know where Bill stands. I know where Sue stands. And I guess I'm, I'm alone in, the, in, in this discussion, but that's right. all right. 
Owning a multiple graded stakes winning racehorse like Hard Not to Love is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard at racing partnerships. Visit their website, westpointtb.com. So we'll move on to the uh, stateside racing uh, of, the, of the past weekend and the Fountain of Youth. Obviously the big story, even even beyond the winner, was, was Dennis's moment who was a total no-show and really never looked comfortable, honestly. Like, he, he, didn't, he didn't get into a good position. On the backstretch, he didn't look comfortable in between horses. And then by the 3 eighths Paul, he was completely gone. And I, I want to give credit. You know, I know there are competitive, but the, the DRF does a good job with the clocker report. And Mike Welsh, who is the Gulfstream clocker, said on that report that he didn't seem like he was training as well as he did pr- prior to the Breeders' Cup when he was a two-year-old. And I, they, they generally do a pretty good job, and they're right about that kind of thing. So I, I mean, maybe you draw a line through it. Maybe he comes back and, and runs everybody off his feet next, off their feet next time. To me, it's hard to envision him bouncing back from that and becoming a top Kentucky Derby contender again. The main takeaway for me of the race was obviously Etienne Dion was incredible. Uh, never looked like a loser. It looked like he was he was cru- on cruise control the entire time. He does have a little bit of a habit to drift out at times in the stretch, and that might cost him at one point. Who knows? We'll get maybe we'll get another Derby DQ, but he just needs a good whipping. That's right. <laughs> okay. Give give uh, Florence Rue two whips. Um, yeah, I'm all about it. No, but uh, the one thing that I took away from that beyond that terrific performance, how much does that flatter? Tis the law because. To me, Etienne Dion, I think, moved a little bit for, forward, but mostly I think he ran the exact same race that he ran in the Holy Bowl, and the difference was there were a bunch of horses that he was better than behind him in the Fountain of Youth, and there was one horse that was way better than him in the Holy Bowl. And another, that's, Tis the Law is a little questionable now, too, because he did have to miss a little bit of training. He did just get back on the work tab the other day. Hopefully he can still make it to the Florida Derby and then eventually the Kentucky Derby. But that was my main takeaway is I thought Etienne Dion ran the exact exact replica of the race he ran in the Holy Bowl, and Tis the Law just blew him away. Well, Etienne was very good. There's no doubt about that. And I, obviously what you said about Tis the Law is definitely all true. The funny thing about this is that Dennis's moment had no excuse from what Dale Romans said afterwards. You know, usually when a good horse runs that poorly, you find out about this injury, that problem, et cetera. They're going to be off six months, maybe even retired. I mean, he's just scratching his head saying that there's absolutely nothing I can find that was wrong with the horse. So is he that bad? No, there's no way he's that bad. So do you put a line through the race? Well, we're not going to have any idea until he comes back into his next start. But I'm with you. I would have a hard time taking him off a performance like that, even without any sort of explanation. Wouldn't be the first horse to bounce back from something like that. But you know, that's a tough way to go when you're trying to get ready for the Derby. Mm-hmm. And there's no excuse as far as it wasn't too hot. It wasn't like there were, you know, th- uh, hundred thousand people there that was throwing Dennis's moment off off his game. Didn't have a bad trip. Didn't have a bad trip. Exactly. The only thing I can I can point to is the fact that, um, you know, the owner did an interview with us, and maybe there's a jinx. <laughs> yeah. But but otherwise, you know, he really didn't have an excuse. Um, you know, since we were mentioning good people in the industry and and highlighting them with with Kieran McLaughlin before, um, I, I did want to you know have a shout out to Robert Tillier, who is the co breeder of of the winner of the Fountain of Youth. Um, just a good guy. Works at uh, at at Bet's uh, Thoroughbreds down in Kentucky, and it's nice to see that that he's uh, getting to enjoy the ride of being the uh, the co-breeder on uh, this wonderful horse. And it's interesting. Uh, we talked about this before. Patrick Biancona now has two Kentucky Derby contenders. He's got this horse, and he's got Soli Volante, which is. I think that's a good position to have when you have two contenders and one is a speed horse and one comes from off the pace. That kind of covers your bases as opposed to having a couple speed horses or a couple deep closers. So that's how I'm going to segue into this weekend's racing. And we have three major three-year-old preps coming up this weekend. We have the San Felipe, Felipe at Santa Anita. We have the Tampa Bay Derby in Oldsmar. And we have the Gotham at Aqueduct. We don't have fields for those races yet, so we're just going on probables. Seems like the star power is concentrated in the San Felipe because you do have Thousand Words and you do have the other Baffert horse authentic in the race. Storm the Court is going to run as well. We'll see if he can step forward off of a, of a pretty subpar three-year-old debut in the San Vicente. So, But that seems like it's going to be a pretty short field, maybe five or six horses. Tampa Bay at the Tampa Bay Derby and the Gotham, I think, are going to have much bigger fields, probably 10, 11 horses. Tampa Bay Derby's got a 
lot of good contenders. The Gotham, I think, has come up way stronger than anybody suspected. The one horse I will mention in particular that I am a fan of and I think is a dark horse that could be, you know, come on late in this season and, and win the Derby or win a Triple Crown race. A horse named Attachment Rate, who is a Dale Romans trainee. He was second on his, in his debut to market analysis, who was a odds-on Todd Pletcher first year at Gulfstream going seven furlongs. I believe he's running in the Tampa Bay Derby this weekend as well. Uh, but attachment rate ran second to him at like 50 to one and then came back in the slop a couple weeks ago at Gulfstream. And it was a weirdly run race because it was – a little bit slow early and then really fast into the second and third fractions and attachment rate blitzed into those middle fractions and kept on going and ran away and won by like six or seven lengths. Maybe the slot moves him up. Maybe it's not quite as impressive. Uh, and maybe he's not quite as impressive on a fast track. We'll probably get to see it this weekend. He's the one I would really look for in the Gotham and going forward. Yeah, and, and Joe, just literally as you were mentioning that, the— uh, What, they scratched the, the, <laughs> No, worse. No, the, the entries just came out uh, from New York, and it looks like the Gotham has a field of 11. Okay. Um, and uh, attachment rate is uh, post four with uh, Louis Saez. Not bad. Um, and it looks like Mischievous Alex, uh, who's probably going to be the favorite, is post six with uh, Kendrick Carmooch, um, trained by John Service. So um, it, it's a bigger field than mm-hmm. I think what they originally anticipated. Um, and it looks like, as you alluded to, it's a deep field. Yeah. And we talked about Mischievous Alex before on the show, and you were mentioning how John doesn't know how far he wants to go. So this will be the next step up from seven furlongs to a mile. But he's obviously got the talent. It'll be interesting to see the way what, what post did he get? Um, he is the six. He's the six. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he's inside or outside the other speed because he did really step forward since being put on the lead in his last two races. So it'll be interesting to see. Kendrick Carmouche is an aggressive rider. I assume he's going to have him forwardly placed. Uh, we'll see if he can step it up against better competition. And, and this is textbook John Service. He loves to step horses up in distance um, in in this way, you know, where he goes six furlongs, seven furlongs, now a one-turn mile. It, it's just a natural progression of not only stepping up in competition, but also stepping up gradually in distance. And I've seen him do it with some of his best horses over the years. And I, I do think it's interesting that Bob Hafford is running two horses into San Felipe, two of his top contenders, especially with the Rebel right around the corner. That's typically a race that Baffert really likes to ship his horses into Oakland and raid that purse, those big purses. But he's still going to be there. He with is with, with, yeah. with Nadal. Nadal, yeah. is, I think, is, is the one he's pointing to that race. So uh, I think we'll learn a lot more after this weekend about where the top Kentucky Derby contenders are. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. Before we get out of here, it's uh, it's it's been mostly good news on this show today, so I had to I had to stick something in to, to bring everybody down. But uh, last Friday we had an interesting story in the TDN written by TD Thornton. He got an exclusive interview with Roman Chapa, who was a jockey in the South and Southwest uh, several years ago, and then got suspended for several years for using a buzzer on a horse. He now has been reinstated by the Texas Racing Commission. What? Which is which that, is staggering. Yeah, to absolutely. Me. And especially since uh, one of the things <laughs> you got to read, you guys got to read the article. But one of the things TD asked him about was what he's been doing in the interim, and he's like, "Yeah, I've been getting into shape, and I'm in great riding shape, and blah blah blah." There's a video of him at one of these bush tracks where they do these horrendous match races where there's no veterinary oversight whatsoever. They drug horses, they shock horses, and he fell off a horse and broke a couple of ribs, and that made it onto Facebook. And once TD started asking him about that, he was like, the messages slowed and then eventually stopped. So this is like, like give me a <laughs> break, man. Like, yeah, this I'm sure this guy learned his lesson that he was riding in these horrible – animal like you want to talk about animal cruelty like compared to race racing is should be on the top very top of examples compared to this garbage that's allowed to happen across the country it's illegal but the feds do a bad job of 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 catching it come on like this is the guy you want to represent your sport in texas are you kidding me like he's he's clearly just saying whatever he'll he has to say to get his job back he's done this stuff before he'll do it again and what what do you think? What, what kind of what kind of image do you think this is going to project to people? And I I, I give Texas Racing credit sometimes because Sam Houston does a good job. They got low takeout. They got big fields. I haven't mentioned it yet, but I I think they're a good track to support. 
But come on, these people, this, these are the kind of stuff that you gotta ban people for life. Do not let these people represent racing because it reflects on all of us. It's not just him, it's not just your racetrack, it's not just your state, this reflects on everybody and nobody takes that into account. I don't know what he did, what he told people, what bill of goods he sold the Texas Racing Commission to get his license back, but it's a travesty and they should be embarrassed of themselves. The question is, on that match race, how many times did he whip the horse? 13 times or 14 times? <laughs> that's, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they find him 60% of his earnings <laughs> 60% as well. The $8. <laughs> but yeah, this is like really, really disgusting stuff with like clearly f- frightened to death animals. Like this stuff needs to be snuffed out or at the very least, the people that participate in it should not be allowed back into thoroughbred racing. Give me a break. Well, well the thing that's so shocking is that is that they reinstated him. Um, it, you know, that, that, that to me is a travesty of, of, of the industry um, is that you give a guy like that. There's so many other ills of the industry that you have to worry about is it so important to give this one guy his his uh, his license that's back? what i love to know i would have loved to like sat in that meeting and, and and see what he told these people to get to get his license back because it's it's honestly a joke and if you employ him going forward you should be ashamed of yourself on that note on that lovely <laughs> note <laughs> this has been the tdn writers room the TDN Riders Room is sponsored by Keeneland, the home of world-class racing and industry-leading sales. The spring race meet begins Thursday, April 2nd. I'm looking forward to it. And Keeneland's next auction is the April 2-year-olds in training and Horses of Racing Age sale directly after opening weekend on April 7th. There's still time to nominate your Horses of Racing Age with entries being accepted up until the sale. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, our Green Group Guest of the Week, Mark Cassie, our editor, Nathan Wilkinson, and our producer, Patty Wolf. We will talk to you next week. 